Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everyone. My guest this week is Nick Weissel. He's a fellow amateur. He's in California on the West Coast. I'm in New York on the East Coast. So we've got the U.S. bookended this week. We're going coast to coast. Nick is very popular in the adult improver and club player community. He's very well known on Chess Twitter, or X as they now call it, and I'll put any links for Nick in the show notes. So Nick, great to see you. I've been meaning to invite you on for a while. Good to have you on. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Neil. No, it's my pleasure. Let's start with a couple of things here, because there's a lot I want to discuss and unpack. Your Substack or your email list, I thought was really interesting. You do book reviews and tournament recaps. Can you tell us a little bit about that and you know why you started it and the th- types of things you like to discuss? I started the Substack because I realized that I was going through a lot of books and um, a lot of uh, stuff I was reading because I want to get better at chess. And the problem with chess improvement in general is that there are so many good resources uh, that it's kind of hard to sift through and choose what you want to choose. And um, I just decided that because I was going through books, um, maybe other people would be helped if I said, hey, this is a good book or this is a bad book, et cetera. Um, And also it just gives me an outlet to write about chess and not blow up, say, like my Facebook feed with rants about this board game that most people on my friends list don't really understand. Um, And so I wanted to have a centralized place where I could just put everything that I reviewed and put all the reviews up there. So uh, I chose the, uh, I just chose to use Substack because I just like the platform and I like the way it works and it's easy to edit. Um, And I, um, besides using that for book reviews, I also, like you said, I put up um, tournament recaps or uh, often like game recaps And uh, the main reason why I do that is to just keep myself accountable to analyzing my games and to thinking about the games and also uh, using words and variations to explain what I think went wrong in the game or what went right in the game, um, just so I can keep myself honest. So um, probably this means that I'm helping other people prep for me sometimes, but that's okay. Uh, I'm honestly not too afraid of anybody's prep. I'm not really at the level where prep matters. So um, yeah, those would be the two two big reasons and two big kind of things that I post on, on the sub stack. I agree with you about the prep because whenever I hear like 12, 13, 1400 players, oh, I prepped for my opponent. I'm like at this level, you could pretty much type out and send to your opponent a week in advance what you're going to play and it probably won't matter because (laughs) there's just so many mistakes, so many directions it goes in. And then what players do is they plan a certain line. Oh, well, my opponent plays this opening. so And then you prep for it and then they go in a different direction. They don't play it. And Mm -hmm. then you get frustrated or you you try to make it come back. It's like, okay, no, 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 no. You got to play the position in front of you. He didn't didn't go into your prep. He didn't walk into your prep. You need to move on now. But- Play, that, that's why I think the whole prepping for your opponent thing at this level is overrated. I agree. But in looking at some of your posts in your sub stack, some of the comments and about your amateur opponents, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying about how a lot of the games go. Mm-hmm. And I also agree with you that it really is overwhelming how much material there is. Like, I completely agree with you. That's actually going to be an upcoming episode for me about sort of like decluttering your study plan. I'm still kind of kicking around how I'm going to present it, but I think that's very well said. I agree with you. So let's move on to your rating goals. Now, are you thinking in terms of points or just getting better? Are you looking to make master? Are you looking to maybe just, you know, get to a hundred points higher where you are now? I mean, I think I saw something where you, you'd like to get to master at some point. I'm just curious what your sort of plan or thoughts are on that. I do have a long-term goal 
of reaching national master in the United States Chess Federation. Um, so, you know, a rating of 2200. Um, that's a long term goal. Um, I set myself that goal about uh, two years ago, three years ago now. Um, so I would like to, at the end of 2031, be a national master. Um, but every rating goal that audacious needs to have stepping stones. And so last year, my goal was to reach 1750. Um, I missed that by just a little bit in the middle of the year. And then uh, my rating continued to tank. So I, I went below 1650, actually, and uh, just barely managed to stop the bleeding right before the end of the year. Um, but this year, my goal is to make 1800. And uh, I think I can do it. I think I have the ability, the skill to do it. Um, what I need is consistency, and um, I think I need to iron out some of the wrinkles in my thought process, but like actual ability-wise, I don't think I'm actually that far off from being able to do so. I just need the tournaments and um, a string of successes to actually make that 1800 rating goal. So uh, I know that 2200 is uh, audacious to make such a goal, especially for somebody who didn't really start playing until they were an adult. Um, but, um, every time I play chess, I, and make, uh, make a milestone that I've never made before. I th I'm kind of surprised that I did it. Um, so why not, uh, keep pushing that as far as I can go. Um, so if I make national master by the time I'm 41, that'd be cool. We'll, we'll have to see how it goes. I really like the way you're framing this and it's funny. Our trajectory with rating is very similar. Because I had, I mean, I was almost 1900 and then I really, really shot down. I actually went from, it was 1885. I dropped all the way to my floor to 1600. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very embarrassing for me to admit this, but I'm just going to open up to everybody here. So I dropped down to my floor. Now it's, it's, I'm almost 1700 again now, but you know, it was like four or five years ago, I was 1885. And I guess between going back for a degree, there was some you know, very strong underrated players at the club. You know how it is. Yep. You know, a couple, couple of bad tournaments, you know how it is, a couple of bad matchups, you know, let's say you have two painful losses, you could lose 50 points or more just from those two games. Mm -hmm. And I'm slowly working my way back up. But I, I will tell you this, because I didn't start playing in tournaments and getting serious until I was in my late 20s. And I almost got to 1900. You can do it. Trust me, you'll, you'll get to 1800. And then- you know, hopefully you'll hang out there for a while, then you build it up to 1900. But I definitely think you can do it. I think the amateur chess scene, though, is extremely difficult nowadays. It's a yes. lot different from when I started playing because I remember when I was like bouncing around in the 1700s for a while, before I broke the 1800 range, I mean, there were players 17, 1800, that range that I was drawing and beating. Like I was getting, you know, and now you have players rated, you know, 14, 15, 1600, where it's like you're scratching your head almost every move, some of them. The problem now, because I was thinking about this in preparing for this interview, when I was almost 1900, because I'm thinking like, why am I having, you know, why is this path back to where I was so difficult? And I'm wondering if you can relate to this. When I had my highest rating, I was playing stronger players. The competition was much stronger because at the club, we had a lot of 17, 18, 1900 players, even experts, you know, some of which I was drawing, maybe an occasional win. But I'm finding now with the boom and all the new interest that the rating range of like our club, the Long Island Chess Club, it's skewing very, very low. Like most of the players, probably 80% or more of the players are below 1600. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm having trouble because I'm just not facing enough competition. So if it's a five round event, I'll be lucky if I get maybe two games where the opponents are rated higher. And then if I have a loss or if I have to take a buy, you know, like the last tournament, just because of family stuff and work, I out of five rounds, I could only play two mm -hmm. and it was two lower rated players. So I'm like, okay, there you go. And if, you know, if I were to play next week, I probably would have had a decent pairing, but I had to take a buy again. So I, you know, but because there's less, strength at the club level now, I think it's harder. This is why a lot of players who are very concerned about increasing their rating are not playing at the club level. They're, they're looking for weekend events with stronger competition. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what your local OTB scene is like, but are you seeing that at your club as well? I'm just wondering what your experience is. Yeah, so I will say uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I had a game against a player who was rated just under 1,000. And so I'm 1650, 1658 at the time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and uh, I had the black pieces. He had the white pieces. He, he played the the mainline scotch um, and he, he made a short, shortly into the game he made a he made an interesting move that i hadn't seen before and um i didn't react very well and i played very um passively in a way that i probably typically wouldn't but i had some i I just made some errors in my thought process and uh, that game was extremely difficult like i ended up winning it but i only won it because of his inexperience with when you have a good position you probably don't want to trade everything especially you don't want to like get a queen trade in you want to keep Queens on the board so you can attack a weak king, et cetera. My king was very weak. Um, and um, once he traded queens, I was able to activate my position and I checkmated him very quickly. But for the first, you know, two hours of sitting at that table, I was having a really hard time trying to figure out how I wasn't going to lose to um, this kid who was rated a thousand. <laughs> so um, I think part of it's uh, so I do think the, the ratings I think players are just stronger for their rating. Um, I think this is like, this is just a well attested to fact that players are stronger for their rating than they were uh, even 10 years ago. There are so many good resources. Uh, Chess improvement has largely been democratized by like YouTube and uh, chess.com lessons, et cetera. It's not hard to find good advice for the game. And uh, so because of that, everybody has a puncher's chance, at least at winning a game. It doesn't matter what your rating is. Um, you can, you can, if you're rated 400 points below the player that you're playing against, you are, you still have a good chance of winning. Um, and so when I first started playing, I was getting all of those wins. And and now that I've been playing at the club for a couple of years, I'm the person that other people are getting those wins against. (laughs) So, uh, the cycle completes and it's not because I think I'm a weaker player. I think it's just because the level of play is like increased so much. And so I do know a couple people um, who were former regulars at the club who uh, have expert level ratings who no longer compete at the club because they're looking for higher rated weekend events or, you know, so like in Sacramento, we're relatively close to the Bay Area. So sometimes they're going out to mechanics on the weekend um, or somewhere in like San Jose or San Francisco to um, to play against tougher competition, to hopefully boost up their rating. Right. Um, yeah, that's actually a very common phenomenon is that the normal weekly OTB tournaments, like you might see like a couple players rated near 2000, but for the most part, the stronger players have moved on to the weekend events because it's too risky. They, they might lose rating to a weaker player and that'll tank their, their goal. You know, a lot of them have the goal of reaching national master. That'll tank their goal if they lose a game or if they, even if they draw a game, it's hard to beat, it's hard to beat people at chess anymore. <laughs> so... Yeah, what you just said, it's exactly the same thing over here on the East Coast because a lot of my regulars who were 2,000, 2,100, even master, I'm not seeing them as much or at all for that reason, just because they feel, because you know there are so many players at the club who are lower rated, that's typical, and they're essentially just playing to maintain their current rating, right? Because yep. if they beat, if you're rated, say, 2,100, if you beat a 1600 or 1500, whatever it is, what are you going to get? Three, four, five points. Right. But if you draw or, or lose, you get a significant hit, right? If a 2100 yep. draws a 1500, that might be like, I don't know, 15, 18 points. If a 2100 loses to a 1500, that might be like a 30 point hit. And think how hard it is. We all know how hard it is to gain 30 points on your rating. So they just don't want to put it at risk. So what I'm seeing now, I mean, we have one older gentleman, strong player. He's like, I think about 2000, but after him, I think the next highest rated is like 1800, mm-hmm. which, you know, for the club level was unusual. Cause when I first started playing in, in tournaments at the club level, you would see a lot of experts, a lot of two thousands, a couple of titled players, you know, we would see Jay Bonin, you know, because he's a New York guy. Jay, mm-hmm. Everyone knows Jay. He's like he's like an I am. He played at every club. He played like 10 times a week, <laughs> you know. But it's funny. Here's the thing about Jay Bonin. Shout out to Jay. He's a good friend. I don't know if he's listening to the pod. He was a guest a while back. The thing with Jay 
a lot of players, a lot of class A players draw him. Like if you look at Jay's sort of weekly club history, I guess, you know, his, mm-hmm. his game history, like a lot of 1800 players, like he draws a lot of class A players. Cause the problem is you're an IM, but if you're playing that many times a week, there's just no way you're going to have your A game every night. You just can't. Right. Yeah. There, you know, I mean, I actually drew Jay when I was like 1650, something like that, you know, and that was a legit slow time control OTB tournament game. But I know a lot of class A players have drawn him and that's not a mark on his ability. It just goes to show that when you play over and over and over again against weaker competition and you're playing all the time, it's going to happen. You're going to have those statistical anomalies. It's part of the bell curve where, you know, you're going to lose or draw some games. I mean, I mentioned I studied with, I am Danny Kopak, who is no longer with us, you know, rest his soul. But he was a Long Island guy. He actually lived 20 minutes from my house. And he told me, he goes, for me to play at your club, Neil, he goes, I'm basically just putting my rating at risk because he goes, I know. And, and, you know, he put his ego aside. He goes, look, I'm an IM. He goes, I know like a 2000 or a 2100 player is is going to stick me a couple of nights. Like it's going to happen. He <laughs> goes, I, I'm probably going to lose a game. And then my rating takes a hit. If I draw, I'm going to lose points. So he goes, there's really, and, and it's, it's what we talked about. And what you mentioned, Nick, is that these stronger players, they just, they know how tough it is. They don't want to put their rating at risk. And their whole thing is, you know, I'm just going to play on these weekend events, even if I have to deal with kids and stuff, but I'd rather play up a little bit mm-hmm. and just face stronger competition. So it's interesting that we're both dealing with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand. Cause I, I prefer to play up. Like I'd, I'd much rather um, lose yes. to a 2000 rated player and get something really interesting out of it and like learn something. Like I, I always feel like when I play against a stronger player, it ends up giving me like a temporary boost where it just elevates my play in general. I think it's cause I'm, you know, I'm pouring out my entire being, so to speak into this board game for the next hour or two hours. <clears throat> and so when I come out of it, um, there's just a, a level of there's like a habit, like a temporary habit that's been built where I'm I'm thinking about things differently. I'm thinking about things in a in a deeper way. I'm looking at things more broadly and I just become a better player. Right. And uh, the benefit of that is uh, not there when you're playing against a player who like psychologically has the advantage against you because they're rated below you. And uh, they they probably um, have a better chance of. Um, beating you and gaining rating than you do of beating them and maintain, maintaining your rating um, because there are so many unrated players entering the pool who are bringing all of their, you know, possibly 1600, 1400, 1200 level skills in with an, with a, with a low rating, right. Or non-existent rating. <clears throat> and uh, they're surprising people. And there's, there's, you know, there's been, there's just huge upsets. I mean, like, I mean, I did that too. When I, my first USCF rated over the board, um, classical regular rated game, whatever, um, I drew an expert. Uh, and it's not like I played particularly well or like I felt like I played really well, um, but I was an unrated player and um, we just ended up drawing, right? This was like two, two and a half years ago. And um, that is the kind of experience that like I gave to someone else. And now that's the kind of experience that I'm, I'm subject to uh, on the other side where I'm playing against a player who's unrated and plays way higher than what you might think an unrated player would play. Right. Like you might think somebody might have like a 1200 skill level or 1400 skill level, but a lot of time, like people just enter into the game and other than their tournament inexperience and they're, they're just learning how to play. And it's kind of different going from isometric to like actual 3d pieces that you touch with, you know, like there's a tactile feeling to the game that you don't get until you play OTB. And then um, other than that inexperience, and maybe they make some mistakes because, um, you know, there's no touch move in, in uh, like on chess.com or leechess.org, right? Like you can click a piece and then unclick it, or you can, you can like click a piece and drag it and kind of like visualize or help it visualize which what's going to happen, um, et cetera. And, and so just, you know, the unfamiliarity of OTB, but otherwise that's like, that's a 1600 level player unrated possibly, uh, or even, or even stronger. And so I think that we, I mean, the hits keep coming, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, I mean, this past week, 
we had like three or four upsets at the club, even on boards one and two. Yep. You know, at, at least a three or 400 point rating difference. But the first part of what you said about the value of playing up, I agree with you 100%. Like I would embroider on a pillow what you said, Nick, because it's just, you, you, you're spot on. Because in any tournament, like I've said this before, let's say a five round tournament, I would want to play the top five guys, one, two, three, four, five, no matter how I do. Because you're going to get a valuable game. Like you said, it's going to step your game up and win or lose, you have an instructive game to study. You know, you could say, okay, this is a game on record. This is how a 2000 plays. This is how a 2100 plays. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, I've been there also. I've had wins and draws against experts. And the funny thing too, and I always tell people this, when you put their games into the computer, you'd be surprised how many things they miss and how many mistakes they make. Like like people, people don't realize that because- you know, the idea is when you play someone so much higher, you think there's some kind of chess god. I mean, I remember when I first started and I was like a 1, thousand, twelve hundred. I thought if somebody was rated like sixteen hundred or fifteen hundred, I was like, wow, you're mm-hmm. awesome. Like, you know, you're awesome. And you know, I, I remember one guy, uh, I was about maybe eleven hundred at the time, and we were talking online, and I'm like, Oh, what are you rated? He goes, like seventeen hundred. And I remember I was like, Wow, you're seventeen hundred. <laughs> you must be and he's like yeah, that's okay, I guess. <laughs> you know, because it's it's all <laughs> it's all relative, right? Because everyone who's seventeen hundred is like, yeah, I know, but it stinks. I'd really rather be nineteen hundred. And everyone who's nineteen hundred is like, yeah, I guess it's okay. I'd rather be two thousand. And everyone who's two thousand is like, eh, I guess two thousand's okay. I'd rather be twenty. You know, like we're never <laughs> we're never happy, right? Oh yeah, and and, and it, you know it's so true. But I agree. And then I think when you play. Uh, you know, lower rated opponents. And, and just for everyone at home, when I'm using the term lower rated and higher rated, I'm I'm simply talking about the math. I'm not saying that anyone lower rated is somehow like a lesser player. We're just talking, you know, mathematically, right? When, when you play mathematically a lower rated player, it's almost, you feel, and, and I know I go through this and it's probably not the right attitude. You're almost, I don't want to say resentful, but you're thinking like, all right, you know, I got to play this game. If I win, I'm going to get barely any points. If I draw, I might lose points. And then if the lower player, a lower rated, excuse me, player is doing really well, then you're even like more frustrated because you're like, all right, his listed rating is 1200. He's (laughs) clearly not 1200. You know, this guy's playing like he's 1600. So now I have to play like I'm playing a 1600 player. It's going to be a battle. And I'm only going to get like five points out of this, which I know is not how you should think, but let's face it, we're all human and that that's sort of inescapable. You kind of have to block that out. But I agree with you 100% when you say, you know, that the lower rated player probably has the psychological edge because, you know, there's no pressure, right? The lower rated player is expected to lose. If he does lose, his rating is going to take a minimal hit. If he wins or draws, he's going to gain some points. Whereas the higher rated player, you know, all the pressure is on him or her because even when they win, other than getting the point, there's really no benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I do have to say that I think that playing against players who are low rated lower than you is like, it's still like, it's a good skill to have. And it's such that even though my preference would always be to play stronger players, um, I am going to have to continue to play players who are rated lower than I am. And uh, that means that the risk as far as rating goes is greater on my part. And uh that pressure, that psychological pressure is like, that's a good thing to have to learn how to deal with anyway. Um, Because there's always going to be a player who um, is uh, up and coming. They're going to try to get you. They're going to try to to knock you out and they're going to try to hit you as hard as they can. And so you have to be able to deal with that pressure. That means you have to be patient and uh, you have to uh, like, just psychologically, you have to remember that like at the end of the day, the result of the game is the result and you and your opponent both have something to say about it. You have to play the best that you can and try not to like, I don't try to go for quick or cheap wins against um, players who are rated lower than I am because uh, I don't trust their rating. You know, somebody says, you know, I'm unrated. Like I know like that they have been playing chess. I know that they're probably good. They're probably the kind of person who can beat the average person off the streets at a game of chess. And like in that sense, they and I are in the same boat. So I don't want to 
underestimate them just because they don't have a rating or because they have a rating that's lower. And so I try to treat every single game against a player who's rated lower or, late, or rated higher. Um, I try to treat those the same. I'm going to try to win every game. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, you know, keep a good attitude uh, and try to keep like a level uh, psychological state against that player who's rated lower. Okay. Their odds are better, but I can still win, right? Like their rating odds are better. If, even if, even if um, they draw, but I can still win this game. I can still fight back. I can still uh, push hard. And so I try to keep that attitude whenever I'm playing against a lower rated player, because otherwise um you know, it, I can become very bothered very quickly. Like this guy should have folded seven moves ago and he's still defending well. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if I overpress, I get frustrated. I make a bad move. Um, then that's going to come back to bite me. And I don't want that to happen. I've been, I've been burned already multiple times doing that. And so I've just tried to like keep a cool head ever since, but it's, it's still difficult. It still feels unfair somehow, but that's just the way the tournament goes. Right. I can relate what it's, it's amazing. Like we're in complete agreement here and I can relate to pretty much everything you just said. I actually agree with, with chess for tigers on this one, which is when I play a low rated opponent, just wait, wait for the error. You know, like don't force things, just yep. play. It, it's going to happen. And even if the low rated player, even if they even outplay you for a while or they're holding their own, they will generally will drop the ball at some point. You really have to wait them out. It's it's mm-hmm. much more of a waiting game. And I agree with you. As soon as you get impatient and you overpress, that's when you're asking for trouble. Because like you said, a lot of these guys, they're good enough where, like you said, not only can they beat the average person, but if if you slip up, they will find that, right? They'll, they'll yep. find that mistake if, if you overpress and you just got to wait them out. But what happens is, is the ego takes place right because the game is going on and on and you're like okay wait i'm rated you know whatever 16 17 1800 and this 1200 player is holding his own you feel like well what is this something wrong with me like i should be be and, and that's the worst that's the worst oh, yeah. attitude. S- some of those games against the lower rated player that's where you kind of need to drag it out like yep. what i find works with them is and, and this this is a strength of mine where i'm pretty good for the most part at knowing if I trade down into an end game, whether I'll be better or not. And if I find that one spot, even if it's a slight advantage, I'll go into it because I trust my end game skills. Mm-hmm. Because for me, those sort of end game skills and those positional ideas, I'm much stronger at that than tactics. The wild tactical stuff, that's actually not my strong suit. Sure. So if I can trade down into an end game, even if I'm only slightly better, I generally have the chops to get the win against a weaker player. It's going to take a lot longer, but I know Mm -hmm. if I try to go for complications against the low rated player and I go for tactics, there's a very good chance I'm going to mess it up. Yeah. Yeah. And the players like that are taught from, you know, from the beginning of their career to study tactics, 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 right? What they don't necessarily have spent time on is end games. So getting into a simple position where there aren't any tactics where, um, it isn't, you know, pedal to the metal where you have to play as quickly as possible or spend as little time as possible building up your position, right? In an end game, being slow is a virtue. So, um, <clears throat> or it often is a virtue. And so that's, that's where I find my best success against players uh, who are um, a bit, uh, you know, lower rated than I am. It's not really in like the tactical complications of the middle game. It's, when I have a slight, just a very slight positional edge and maybe I can nurse that into something or it's like, it's a subtle edge, but it's actually very simple to slip up in, which is how I beat that one player who I was t- telling you about is rated, rated a thousand. Um, and he had a, he had a great attack going on and his position was good for a while. Um, but as soon as he traded Queens, um, there were a number of um, positional features of the position that I was able to take advantage of that uh, I don't think he accounted for because he just didn't have the experience. Right. And so I got, I got lucky in that regard, but that's really the way I think that that probably needs to be done uh, to, to be a lower, lower rated player. You need to go into something that requires a bit more subtle thinking, something that they haven't necessarily had to think about as much. Right. Most players do tactics. So if you're playing against um, a weaker player, maybe an end game is the better way to do it. So makes it makes sense to me what you're saying no i find at the club level in general not even against 
players rated the same or higher than you is to go into these end games or just these sort of boring stale positions because you know, we always talk about dynamic playing you know play dynamically but when you go into a tactical thing they're going to look for that right like what, what's the yep. old saying like you know tactics are what you play when you know what to do and positional play is when you don't know what to do yeah the positions where my opponents seem to struggle the most and get the most frustrated and make a mistake. It's not the tactical stuff. It's the stuff where it's just this dry. They have no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. That's where I want to get my opponent because those positions I'm very comfortable with. Okay. Or I'll just play, if neither of us know what to do, I'll just play like a nothing move, like a sort of a cat and mouse thing. Mm -hmm. And they'll try to force things because if they're very tactical, they don't know how to do that. Like every move has to have sort of a heaviness to it for them. Like it has to attack something or it has to open. But if it's like a quiet retreating positional move, they don't like doing that. Mm -hmm. Right? Like a yeah. retreating a, re a retreating night move might be the best move in the position, but they don't want to do that. It's they, it feels too slow for them, even though it's it's what the position calls for. So if you can get these dry, boring, you know, boring positions, that's where the mistake happens, right? In the in the positional play. Because if it's an open tactical thing, they're going to find something to do, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, it's a technique you can use because, you know, between Puzzle Rush and playing online, everything is tactics. Ta so if, if you give them a very tactical-based position, all players, low-rated ones as well, they're going to find a way to handle that and, and find a way out of it. Whereas if it's a dry positional thing where they have to come up with a plan and really think, that's where they drop the ball. Yeah, yeah, either they spend too much time uh, trying to figure out what to do because they don't feel comfortable with the position. They don't really have a natural feel for where which pieces should go where, uh, or they just rush into it and they just kind of throw caution to the wind and they make a subtle error that costs them the game. So let's talk about studying and sort of not preparing, but things that you do to study between your over the board games because there are some different theories out there about what's helpful and what's maybe hurtful so what are your thoughts on say playing online blitz or rapid between rounds like during the week as part of your study do you think that helps your otb classical game do you think it hurts it what are your thoughts on that yeah so when i'm playing um so I'm blessed to have a, a club where we often have like weekly games. Um, usually it's a tournament. And so they're, um, you know, it might be like a, a tournament five rounds. So it'll take five weeks. And so in between those weeks, uh, if I'm playing chess online, well, I'm, I'm always playing chess online. I should be clear about that. But when I'm playing <laughs> chess online, um, if there is, uh, if I have a tournament game uh, coming up within the next week, I, I usually just focus on blitz. Um, I do enjoy playing rapid here and there. Um, but I found that, um, I think that my time is probably better spent getting in a few kind of like a, a, a different sort of set of reps, which I think it blitz is more conducive toward. Um, now I do also spend a lot of time doing calculation exercises, like long calculation exercises or difficult positions. Um, and in general, I try to like keep, keep up on my tactics and, um, think deeply about positions in general. So I am getting that somewhere though, to be clear, the p kind of positions where uh, I don't get, I don't really get the same kind of positions that I wouldn't like a, a famous tactic book or whatever, a famous calculation book. There's lots of beautiful positions in there that almost never would occur in one of my games, but just building up that habit of looking at a position and thinking about it and contemplating what the best ideas are looking at all my opponents ideas and my ideas and thinking about whether or not something will work, et cetera. Um, I do that even if I'm not playing rapid games. So I feel like during, um, during a tournament season, right. Where I've got like five weeks of long games ahead of me for the next, you know, five, five weeks, uh, I'll just play blitz games. Uh, and then when I don't have any tournaments coming up and I want to like sit and think about a game, uh, I will, that's when I'll pull out the rapid and I'll, and I'll start playing rapid. So I haven't done rapid, a rapid game in a couple months, but um, now that this, this tournament that I just finished playing is over, I might, I might pick up some more rapid in between, but usually I just do blitz in between. Do you use an increment when you play? Like what kind of time controls when you do like blitz or rapid? Yeah, I usually play three plus two. 
three two. Okay. So yeah, I I play with an increment because um, I think that it's important to be able to prove your idea correct, and so an increment will allow you to continue to play on in a game. Uh, and it it also like stops you, or at least it stopped me from making moves just to run out my opponent's clock, because that is a huge issue. Uh, in like blitz without increment, you can just win by playing any old move. Um, but tournament games come with an increment or with a delay, which means that your opponent can hang on by a thread. And uh, if you make a mistake that's easy to refute, as long as you have time. Uh, your opponent can find that. And so I started playing increment because I didn't want to lose games and get into the habit of playing bad moves that would run down the clock because I don't think that that's the way that chess should be played. And that's definitely not the way to play if you want to like become a stronger player at the club. Right. I'm an increment guy all the way. I, I like rapid games more than blitz. I like five, five. That's mm-hmm. kind of like my thing. And when we, I want to get to like our sort of formal study plans, you and I in a moment, but I'm a 5-5 five, five guy now. Of course, I made the mistake recently. I hadn't played online in a while. I was finishing up a degree. So I'm like, oh, like, let me get back into it. Like It's sort of someone who says like, okay, I'm not going to eat sugar anymore. And then, oh, let me just try one thing. Let me just have a little ice cream because I just have a taste <laughs> for it. And you end up eating the whole you know, tub, yep. that type of thing. So I started playing like 5-0 games and I was like, all right, that was dumb. It's just, <laughs> you know, I, I, like, I like the increment because you're not, it doesn't take forever, but yeah, you can still kind of breathe and think a little bit. Yep. So I like five, five. I think that's a great control and then analyze the game after. So, you know, that's, that's what I would do online. And I just think what some people do is they just blitz, blitz, blitz over and over and over, which is easy to fall into. Like that's what happens if I try to do <laughs> blitz without an increment. And, you know, then they wonder why, you know, they're not getting better or they say, okay, I'm going to study a lesson on chess.com. Let me just play two blitz games just real quick and then i'm gonna study right you know where i'm going with this nick right? oh yeah let me let me just play two blitz games real quick right i have an hour before i have to go to bed i'm just gonna play two five oh games and then i'm gonna study for 45 minutes and go to bed so what happens they win their first blitz game they win their second game oh you know what i'm feeling good maybe i'll just play one more game then they lose that game then they lose the next game and then oh i have to catch up now and then <laughs> yep. all of a sudden Right. It's like three hours went by and, and, you know, that that's a trap a lot of people fall into. So and and I think with Blitz, I have a personal story about this. So uh, this is actually this is like a pretty common occurrence until maybe a couple of years ago, because uh, you just a few years ago, I, I definitely like say that Blitz was a vice, not a virtue for me. Uh, and so what happened was I like broke the I broke my like previous rating record, um, as often happens, I would get really excited and i was like okay well i'm 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 clearly on fire and just gonna keep going right so i think i i I broke the 1600 barrier for the first time and so it's like the day or like it's like a couple days before we're about to leave on a family vacation and um we need to get some equipment for our dog that we had at the time and uh and i just like broke in 1600 on chess.com blitz and so i was just excited and okay I, i got the stuff that i needed from the pet co that i went to and I was like, okay, I bu- I did it. I did all my adult things. Now I'm gonna sit in my car and play Blitz, and I'm gonna try to get my rating up really high. Uh, and uh, of course, what happened was I ended up sitting in the parking lot for about two hours in my car, crunched in my little like sports car. And I'm a pretty big person, but uh, I was uh, <clears throat> so engrossed in this uh, series of Blitz games that I was playing, and I was just losing rating. I think I lost 250 rating points in the Petco parking lot playing Blitz. So for a long time, uh, Blitz was a vice for me <laughs> because of what you were talking about, where you just want, you're going to play a couple games. And in this case, it wasn't even just like chess study. I was just like neglecting actual adult life duties that I was supposed to be doing. And I sat in the parking lot in my car, uh, cussing my head off. The windows were up. So probably people didn't hear me, but you know, somebody's walking by, they would have heard me cursing. Uh, as I was continuing to drop rating points, 1,600, 1,500, 1,400. I think I quit at 1,350. And then I decided to go home. So Blitz is dangerous. If uh, you don't have the self-control, it becomes an addiction really quickly. And so that was something that I really had to learn to avoid, which now I I do that pretty good. If I lose a couple games, I typically quit. 
But uh, beforehand, I would, you know, maybe play 20 games before I decided that it was enough. Almost everybody listening to this podcast can relate to that in some way, (laughs) in some degree, a similar story about playing online, because there is a very, very addicting nature to blitz games. Yeah, there really is. And so I, I don't think that story probably is not unusual. And I appreciate you sharing it. But that's like you said, it can easily become a vice. Yep. And I think I think for some people it might even might even be worse than that. And they go through that, you know, on a on a regular basis. Yes. Now, here's what I want to do, if that's okay. Can you talk about your general study plan? like formally, like, like everything you kind of study, like what's a typical study session for you? I know we spoke about sort of the online chess component of it, Mm -hmm. but as far as like analyzing your games or books and, you know, I have mine, I was going to share mine, but I kind of want you to go first. I'm curious what that consists of and how many hours a week you're studying that type of thing, however you want to present that. Yeah. So, um, I, I got some advice from Kostya Kavutsky from the chess dojo, um, this is general advice. It wasn't to, towards me specifically, uh, but he was talking about um, like making your study plan like simple and sustainable. And so um, his idea was to whatever thing you want to focus on studying, just study that, study that an hour a day and whatever else you want to add on top of that, you can add on top of that. Right. Um, but if you want to buy a chess book, and actually study and read it or get a chess course and study it and go through it. Um, you need to actually dedicate time to do it. And you don't want to have all of your hands in uh, different in a bunch of different baskets. <clears throat> um, and so I, I generally follow that advice. If I'm going through a book collection, um, I will, or a game collection, um, I will go through, I will read that for usually an hour a day, unless I'm not feeling like studying, like, like, you know, I've been kind of under the weather, which means I've been studying a little less. And uh, after, so every like Wednesday, which is the day after the the game that I play at the club, usually I'm just mentally exhausted. So I, I use that to take a bit of a slight break, but um, I will read a book. Um, and by read a book, I mean, like I usually have a Kindle version and I have a Lee chess analysis board and I'm going through it move by move. I'm creating a Lee chess study. I'm asking questions about the position. I'm drawing arrows. I'm trying to guess what the next move is going to be or what the plan is going to be. Then I read the annotations and try to figure it out from there. Um, and I'll do that, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm being dil- diligent, I'll do that, you know, at least an hour a day, six days a week, try to give myself a rest day. Um, and then besides that, uh, regardless of what I'm studying, I do tactics. doesn't have to be hard tactics or easy tactics, just any kind of tactics. So, Usually um, I've found that I just prefer curated tactics in like a course or a book and I'll just go through those. Um, I like using chessable a lot. So I like to do a lot of the the spaced repetition for tactics in particular. So um, for simple tactics, I like to, you know, find a, a course or two or three on chessable. I'll just pick one of those and uh, just go through it um, daily and just try to like get my reps up and uh, just continue to do the tactics. And then also if I have time, I'll do a little bit of, harder or more difficult calculation. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I can do, a, sometimes I do a lot. Sometimes I do a little, just depends. Um, you know, there's some days where, or like January, I set myself a, a challenge on chess.com. I reset my puzzle rating. How high can I get my puzzle rating up to? Right. And so uh, for the first like couple of days, I can shoot from 400 up to about 2300 on chess.com's puzzles and then after that i actually have to like stop and think about it and i could just pour hours and hours and hours into like studying that so um i have to be careful but yeah generally speaking i do a game collection i do puzzles um if i'm feeling like i need to study something i might study like anything else i might study some opening stuff or some end game stuff but other than that i just try to make sure that i play games and analyze them uh, if I have an OTB game that I played on Tuesday, then I tend to not work too hard the rest of like the week leading up to that. I will, um, I'll just try to like enjoy chess and, you know, let the hard work that I did the months prior kind of assimilate over time, right? Like I don't want to like exhaust myself, especially on the day that I'm going to play the tournament. Um, and then the day after that is typically when I'll actually do the full analysis of the game open up a lead chess study. Uh, I do have the engine on. 
So I check, I check with the engine, uh, I check ideas. I, and if I see an idea that makes sense uh, from the engine, then okay, I just move on. If it doesn't make sense to me, then I don't worry about that idea too much, right? If the engine thinks that I should have played this weird move, uh, I tend to ignore stuff like that. But um, yeah, analyze my game and just go through it. Uh, Time-wise, I would say I probably average around 12 hours a week studying. I don't really have very many other hobbies. So occasionally I might play a video game, at which point that comes at the expense of my chess study, which is okay. Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd, I'd spend on average around 12 hours a week studying. And that's not including playing blitz games. That's just, um, doing actual thinking about chess. That's a lot. That's a lot of study for it is. an amateur player. No, good for you. No, that's good. So here's mine. So basically just to put this in context, I just finished up an advanced degree I graduated in December. It's still kind of messing with my head. I don't know. I have, <laughs> it's, I'm going through some kind of, I don't know, like post academic PTSD or something. I don't know. It's because it, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it was, it was such, it was such an intense thing, you know? And, and, you know, one of my advisors was telling me, it's like, like, this is common. It's sort of like this letdown thing. Cause you're putting so much time into this. And then it's like somebody flips a switch and takes that away. I mean, I got through it. I don't know how, I kept the podcast going while I was doing it. Somehow I did it. Yeah. You know, people said like, how did you, and I, the, the answer is like, I don't know. I mean, the truth is, and this is my nerdy side. I actually enjoyed like going for my doctorate and writing my dissertation. I know we talk about how it's like torture for people, but in some deranged way, I actually enjoyed it. You know, I, I enjoyed my topic and writing and reading. I kind of like doing that, but my chest study took a big hit, but that's, <laughs> that's on me. Yeah, that's, that's on a complaint. That's, that's a choice I made. I, I knew what I signed up for. So for a while it was just like a couple of puzzle rushes. And then like one other thing that was my puzzle rush plus one study plan thing. Right. So then what I, what I was doing or what I started doing after I graduated for the past few months, it was basically, I would review my tournament games like very intensely. And then it would be like one other thing. So it was that plus one other thing, whether it was looking at a book or usually it was a chess.com lesson. Now, what I want to work back into, this is what I kind of want my regular study plan to be. I don't think it's going to be quite as much as yours, but I'm, um, you know, I want it to be regular. I think the consistency is what's most important, right? You know, getting in a half hour, 40 minutes a day is much better than say five hours, one day a week or something like that. Yeah. So I, I want to do a puzzle, one puzzle rush, just one, right? Because if you know it's one, you know you'll do it. If you have to do five, you might get lazy, right? So <laughs> one puzzle rush, and this is important because I think most people don't do this, and then analyze it after. Look at the ones you got wrong. I think that's important. And for me, puzzle rush is not so much necessarily about the score or the speed, but just as a warm up, just to get the circuits firing just to kind of get your brain into that. And then look at the ones you got wrong. So one puzzle rush, one five, five game on chess.com and then analyze it. And I only say one because then you know, you'll do it and you know, you'll analyze it after. Cause if I say play three, five, five games of four, then you're just going to kind of go game after game. I mean, that's just my head, mm -hmm. right? That's where my head space is at. So one puzzle rush and analyze it one five, five game and analyze it. And then as needed, analyze my weekly OTB game, right? Which yep. won't be every day. And then sort of the meat would be one other thing, whether it's a chess.com lesson module or a book, like one other thing. Yeah. So that, that's sort of my study plan. So the daily thing would basically be the one puzzle rush, the one five, five game and the one other major thing you're studying. Yep. And then that fourth thing, analyzing my weekly over the board game would be as needed. And, and sometimes that might take no time at all. I mean, if I'm rated against, say, if I'm uh, paired, I should say, against, let's say a 1000 player who really is a 1000 player, you know, and he hangs his queen on move four. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. that's going to be an easy week. Right. But if, if it's say against an 1800 player and I draw and it was a tough game down to the wire, I can get a lot of instructional value out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's the plan that I kind of want to start getting into. So, you know, life gets in, like January and February have, they were just kind of crazy. So I think things will start to mellow out a little bit. And then that's what I want to get into. So now you're into 
game collections though, right? That's like a big thing for you. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, it's good to study things in chronological order. And so for me, that chronological order has been starting with Morphe, um, going through players that were considered the best in the world, right? So like apart from Morphe, that would be like the world champions. So like Morphe, Steinitz, Lasker, Capablanca. And I, I did take some time to study uh, some of Capablanca's hypermodern contemporaries and Rubinstein. And then now I'm studying Eliokin. And um, in general, uh, when I look at a game collection, I'm trying to find collections of games that are like good, like that are good games to learn from. But the order going into chronological order kind of like allows you to see how our understanding of chess has um has changed over time. So you kind of like get some like history out of it, which I really enjoy. I actually really enjoy the historical aspect of, of chess and even chess theory. Um, and you also, when you study enough players, you start to see how they might be different. So uh, for instance, like the fact that Capablanca and Aliokin, Rubinstein, Nimzovich, uh, Richard Reddy, um, all those players were competing at this and Lasker were all competing at the same time. You kind of get to see their perspective and their perception of how chess should be played. And these were people who were playing at the same time. So they had, they actually had to like put their ideas on the board and try to prove each other wrong and, um, and prove themselves correct. And, um, I've found that to be like, particularly like, it's just interesting, but also I think like it's definitely elevated the way, like I think about moves, um, I think it's like really easy um, to become very dogmatic about what makes a chess move good. And then uh, especially like if you just rely on like engine analysis to say this, this is the best move in the position. Um, but to see other players um, argue about that move or argue about their moves over time, um, this has just been very interesting. So I, I look for game collections that, um, that reflect that or that uh, I try to find an annotated game collection um, and uh, go through a player's games and like, see like what ideas did they have? You know, like thinking about Morphe, not just as like a, a tactical genius, but really like the world's first positional player. Right. And so like, what ideas do we see in Morphe's games that we can still find today? What ideas can we take from it and, and play in a contemporary style? Um, and uh, just doing that for every player. Uh, throughout history um and so part of it's just like pure enjoyment i just enjoy learning about chess and the players and how they thought and um i enjoy the historical aspect i also enjoy the the theoretical aspect and like there are some really beautiful games from the late 1800s and early 1900s that um like they're classics for a reason they're very instructive in how how you should play a particular position sometimes or how you should play against a particular um weak opponent who's weak in a particular area um so that's generally how i pick game collections is by going chronological order through the uh world champions and any other players that i find important i have a spreadsheet where i just add players names oh this player like if i see a game that looked like a really interesting uh game or a, a player is given a particularly interesting description um i will write that player's name down somewhere and look for a game collection that I might consider getting so that I can go through it. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing it through chronological order. Um, occasionally I'll get a game collection like the mammoth book of the world's greatest chess games, which goes in chronological order, but it has everything from, you know, like the early 1800s to, you know, 2020 or whatever. And, um, and I just enjoy those games cause I like the games cause they're beautiful. So um yeah, I, generally speaking, I just look for um, good reviews. Um, if there's an author that I've read that I like their books before, usually I check to see if they've written anything else and try to find it. Um, I do like the Move by Move series by Everyman Chess, um, but that's generally my um, – that is like my fallback if I can't find something else. So, um, so that's generally what I look for. I do have like a couple Aliokin uh, game collections – uh, that have like all of his own notes and there's like a hundred plus games in each of those books or whatever. And so I really like going through and reading his thoughts, uh, New York, 1924, which I recently posted a review of on my, on my sub stack. That book is amazing because you're seeing one of the greatest players, uh, at that time, trying to understand everything that's happening with everybody else that's going on. And like, 
So you see him kind of like criticizing like Frank Marshall and Richard Reddy a lot and also talking about Capablanca or Lasker. Um, and uh, so just historically getting some personality out of the out of the books is very interesting. And um, I mean, like New York 1924, I don't know if you ever went through that, but um, just an amazing book. And it's real, like my favorite part of that book is how Richard Reddy, who's kind of like this like rogue uh you know he's a hyper modern right but like i think a better word for him is neo romantic <laughs> seeing uh how he like starts playing one night f3 and then he does the double fianchetto with g3 bishop g7 b3 bishop b7 and um seeing how like capablanca and aliokin are like oh this can't be correct or whatever and then they start playing one night f3 in the same tournament um stuff like that is really interesting so just seeing how the history develops and so if a book is like well-reviewed, if it's like, if it's referred to as a classic, generally, like those are the ones that I'm going to look at first. I'm, I'm going to consider getting them first um, because I just, yeah, I just enjoy reading through game collections. I think that it's not really about like, oh, I remember when I'm playing a game, I, I see a position thing. Oh, I remember it was this book, this game from this book on this page. And this player did exactly this. No, I think it really is just, seeing different ideas over and over and over and just kind of letting them seep in, kind of letting them marinate. And then when the time comes, you suddenly have an idea that kind of comes out of the blue because you've been subconsciously um, integrating it into your thought process over the last couple of months since you like read through a book or saw players, games, et cetera. And so that's where I think the, the big benefit is from that, but they do have to be annotated and, um, I think that anytime that you're going through a game collection book that has notes in it, um, don't take any author's conclusions uh, at face value. If you have a question about a position, you have a question about a move, turn on the engine, make the move, see what the engine suggests and try to figure out why it suggests that. Or maybe, uh, maybe the idea that's given in the book is actually wrong. Right. And so pay attention to those moments and like try to think actively. Don't just like go through it. But yeah, I do. I do love me a good game collection. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting both practical value and aesthetic value, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. See, I, I admire that. I never got into game collection books, if I'm being honest. Now, I don't know. Maybe a lot of them are like E4, E5. A lot of them are openings mm -hmm. I don't play, Yeah, which is no excuse. <laughs> I guess I'm... I'm being a little too pragmatic. I, I I sort of like just the general sort of overall amateur instructional books type of thing. And my whole thinking is I'll just get like something like Now What, right? The Jeremy Silman chess.com lesson where, you know, he has a course called Now What, where it's basically all these middle games, like the beginning of the middle game from the opening. Mm -hmm. And now what do you do? But he curates games from different players. I guess I, I let other people do the work for me, so to speak, but... As far as a pure game collection from one player, yeah, I don't know. I, I never got – it's something I probably should get into. I just never got into that. But the fact that it helps you so much, that's really cool. Yeah, it's – I mean, it's not for everybody. So um, I don't think, like, people have to feel bad if they haven't studied a particular player. But I've been surprised um, at the ideas coming from particular players. Like, um, I mean, anytime – like, if when you, like, hear Rubenstein, what is the first thing you think of when you hear the name Akiba Rubinstein? Players, like when you think of like Rubinstein, like usually like the first thing said about him is that he's like the greatest endgame player, one of the greatest endgame players of all time, right? Uh, and uh, he's very solid, very uh, positional, et cetera. But it, like if you see his game against Jorg Rotlevy, where he sacrifices a queen and mates him with the bishop pair and, um, and uh, two rooks, and it's just one of the most beautiful games, just aesthetically beautiful of all time. You get surprised by the certain reputations that players might have and how their actual play contradicts their reputations or it it's just a little bit unexpected uh, that they would play in such a way when they're known for being a particular way. Like Capablanca has some very amazing attacking games, even though he was kind of like known for being... Um, like a, a boring end game player, not necessarily boring, but, you know, like buttery smooth end game player, but he, he could unleash some really fierce attacks and uh, just seeing how um, <clears throat> player, a player style was not limited to what their reputation was for. That is, I think like one of the most like, like beneficial things about looking at a player's games, 
because it it can help you as a player to become less dogmatic. Because if you think, oh, I should play like Capablanca, well, if you realize that Capablanca would sometimes go on a crazy attacking spree and sacrifice pieces to win the game, you know what I mean? It kind of like helps you get out of uh, like a mindset that might say I'm an X type of player, so I should play X types of moves, right? And so that's that's another benefit that I think, but um, that that only happens if you if you study a lot of players' games and if you you care about their reputations and whatnot. Um, I do like Silman stuff, like Amateur's Mind and um, uh, how to reassess your chess and the idea that it was just like taking a position and like okay, how do you think about this position? What do you try to figure out and what to do next? Um, so I do like that stuff too. Um, but uh, as far as like just like pure enjoyment, and I think if you can enjoy something and learn something at the same time, that's like a that's like a win win. Um, yeah, game collections for me all the way. So let's end with one more segment. I don't know how much you want to divulge, but is it okay if I ask you about like what openings you like to play? Do you mix it up? Do you stick with the same openings? Sure. If I'm asking like top secret stuff, we can, <laughs> we can edit this out. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, no, I do like, I, um, I'm like, I share like anybody who wants to prep for me can just look at my, look at my Twitter <laughs> or my sub stack and they'll, they'll find it. So I don't think I'm like really giving away any like secret, secret message, like everything that I, most of what I've studied, um, you could find on Chessable, right? So you could spend the same amount of money that I've spent and then you could have, you can know what I'm going to play or what I'm likely to play. Um, or you could learn what I forgot in my repertoire <laughs> over the board. So um, yeah, so I'm definitely an E4 player. Um, I really enjoy playing the Rui Lopez. Um, and I like to play it slowly. I like to play D3. I like to build up the position. And um, in general, I I like that. But occasionally I might mm, uncork an Evans Gambit here or there in the Italian. Um, against the French, I like to play the uh, milner Berry Gambit. Um, against the Karakhan, I just go for the advance and try to just enjoy space. So it basically like if there's a way for me to get space in a position, I tend to like, I tend to like openings like that. Um, with black against E4, I keep it solid with E5. Um, just go for mainline two knight C6 stuff. Um, if I get a chance to play the two knights defense, I'll, I'll choose that over the Joko Piano. Um, and, uh, against the Rui Lopez, I just try to like keep things mostly in the main line. Sometimes martial attack, that, that stuff can be fun. Um, and I like to play the Banco Gambit. <laughs> if I can. So I try to keep a mix in there, positional and tactical, because I don't want to like be married down to one style. Um, ever since studying Richard Reddy, I have a really large interest in playing one night F3. So occasionally I'll, I have like a I have like a like an extra openings account or whatever on Lee Chess that I'll use to practice stuff. So I've been playing Night F3 in the English on that. So um yeah, you know, in general, uh, I feel like the more I play, the more experience I get in, in the more games I study, the more experience I have in openings that I've never played. Like, I don't think I'd feel too uncomfortable playing like a Queen's Gambit because I've wa- I've read and seen so many Aliokin games where he plays the Queen's Gambit. Uh, and so seeing how he plays the Queen's Gambit declined, like I feel like I've I've actually like learned a lot, even though that's not really an opening I play. So um, yeah, I do have like a repertoire, but I I'm also like, yeah, I like to play lots of stuff. Like I've grow, I think I've grown an appreciation of a lot of different openings. Um, I used to like hate playing against the London, uh, but to me, I feel like the London is like close to being like a main line anymore. And so I've just learned to play against it, and now I enjoy playing it because it's kind of against it because it's like a, a reverse. It's like a reverse Queen's Gambit if if a black plays critically right with an early C five and D five. So um, yeah, just in general. The, I probably go for main lines more often than not, but um, also I try not to play like absolute main lines. So if there's something interesting on the side that's like close to a main line, I might play that instead. You, you mentioned the advanced variation of the Carol Khan. I'm seeing that a lot at the club. Uh-huh. A lot of guys are playing that. I don't know if that's, I'm not really an E4 guy. I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's some kind of resurgence or if somebody's pushing that, but a lot of Carol Cons at the club and a lot of advanced Carol Cons at the club. A lot of guys play that. I don't know why. Is that is that like a thing now, Nick, that I'm not aware of? I don't. So the reason why I play the advance is because I have Geary's E4 Part 2 on Chessable. That's what he recommends, right? And he, he recommends the short variation. So like a Knight of Three, Bishop E2. And you basically set up the same exact structure that you would in a French advance. 
Um, so, uh, and you just like enjoy your space advantage and try to like go through that. Um, I'm not sure. So I don't really pay attention to like when theory is like what the, the hottest theory is and like why other play- players are playing things. Um, though I do notice like waves of theory, even like in my blitz games, like two weeks ago, everybody was playing the Caracon last week. It's all been the Sicilian, you know what I mean? And I, I don't know why that is. Um, I don't know why, like in my particular player pool on chess.com, it is that way. So yeah, I'm not sure what it is with the, with the Caracon advance and maybe it's, um, you know, I, I don't pay too much attention to top level chess. So maybe there was a really cool game that ag and matter showed or something and now everybody's playing the advance again really not sure <laughs> yeah no same here i mean i i follow the top level chess kind of loosely mm-hmm. you know like now with the candidates coming up maybe a, a little bit more but but generally i'm not one of these people like oh i have to know what's going on in this tournament and i have to know yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you and 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 who has time right <laughs> i mean you can only th- there's only so much you can yeah. do but anyway nick weisel great conversation this was a lot of fun a lot about tournament play and preparation. This was really, really cool. I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And for those of you listening at home, we really appreciate you tuning in. And I hope you win your next game. Have a great week, everybody.